And there was one experience with psychedelics I had never had, which is often reported by people who take psilocybin at higher doses, as well as DMT. And that is the encounter with something that seems to have a mind of its own. And I was interested to have that experience. You know, the psychedelics are the phone call, but you need to hang up the phone. You need to put the phone down, go back into life and explore this and, and seek it or practice it or, or pursue it in your own way. Hi, David. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Michael, Michael, Mike, Dave. Uh, we are back with another video. Mm -hmm. We're going to watch Sam Harris talk about uh, psychedelics, mushrooms, and how that relates to life. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we'll discuss, yeah, or we'll discuss as we so, go along. Um, so two things. This is a Saturday night. Normally we're doing this Friday morning. <laughs> yeah. So this is a new, this is a new thing. Um, I don't have a lot of like firm thoughts, knowledge on this issue. Do you have, so you selected this topic. Is this yeah. something you feel strongly about? Do you I, think a lot about psychedelics? Uh, well, I guess as someone in recovery from drug addiction, I have a lot of experience taking psychedelic drugs. So I guess I have that experience perspective. One other perspective I find really interesting is the difference between someone like Sam Harris, who takes drugs for the purposes of learning about life and his mind, versus people who, and, and not addicts, but there's a large contingent of people who do it almost, I don't know if cosmetically is the right word, but... Recreationally? Yeah, but to the point of they they claim they're doing it for kind of spiritual experiences, mm -hmm. right? Or to mm -hmm. be at one with the world or whatever, but that just becomes a masquerade to justify their overuse. So they n might not be full kind of like addicts, mm -hmm. but they're doing it too much and they're doing it deceitfully in my opinion, right? So they're saying they're doing it to have a cool experience, although they're kind of using it in a way that is not honest, maybe something like that. Does that make sense? It's sort of like, yeah. you know, some people, you'll hear these people like, I'm going to go do a ceremony and there's like some pretend shaman or, or ceremony leader person. And people say they're going to heal. It's like a healing ceremony. I'm going right. to a healing ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. But they don't actually do any healing. They just, just go and get high, yeah, justify getting high. That pretend that they're doing it to heal and then and then repeat so there's a bit of i'm thinking of the idea that popped up in my head was like something related to make mindfulness yes yes 100 percent. the cheapening of a tradition and yeah. using it for superficial reasons yeah 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 um, is that yeah is that we're getting okay and if you can see something moving in the background that's my daughter oh, <laughs> yeah. she's uh hanging out in the office uh, by choice so anyway She's hanging out back there. About a week after I recorded that conversation with Roland, I had my first psychedelic experience in probably 25 years, maybe a little longer. Now, most of you know my history here. I wrote about it in my book, Waking Up, and the relevant chapter can be found on my podcast and in the Waking Up app under the title, Drugs and the Meaning of Life. It can also be found on my blog under that title. Now, I'll issue all the usual caveats here, briefly. Psychedelics are not for everyone. If you do them, you should do them with a guide. I don't recommend tripping at parties or concerts or out in the world where you can stumble into the lives of others or into traffic. And anyone at risk for psychosis probably shouldn't trip at all. As I wrote in Waking Up, some people can't afford to give the anchor of sanity even the slightest tug. Now, unfortunately, I don't know how one determines whether this admonition applies to oneself. Just quick pause there. Mm -hmm. He did just sort of acknowledge what we were talking about yeah. a little bit, right? This isn't for partying at a rave or at a concert or at some festive occasion. Uh, he did say do it with a guide. Um, anyway, so that's just interesting. Just who, clarifying who that. The, I'm, 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 yeah. I'm very, I lack any knowledge. Of it. What, what, who are these guides? <laughs> maybe we'll yeah 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 you know, maybe but... yeah um from what i understand from psychedelic psychotherapy mm. you do it in the confines of a therapy office 
Right. And you don't necessarily have the person sitting in the room with you, but they're close by. They're mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. They're around if you need them. And so that's, I think, what he means by that. And I do think there's a clinical or a research definition of what that is. But like in your, like in your practice, can yeah. you do that? Are you, you Techn- I would actually feel comfortable doing that, yeah. but I don't have any particular training or qualifications. Right. And I do think they are out there. It, it is something that I might be interested in pursuing at some point, but right now it's not something I, I do. I have I have referred clients to do ketamine treatment, Mm -hmm. psychedelic ketamine treatment. Uh, And I'm thinking of one person in particular who found it really helpful. Yeah. And there was a guide and he was. But if you're concerned about this, you should talk to a psychiatrist or a psychopharmacologist or someone who can give you personal guidance. I really don't think people should take these drugs lightly. And as scientific research with psychedelics continues, and the opportunity to take them in a controlled setting becomes more available, I think it will become easier to evaluate these things and to explore these landscapes of mind safely. For instance, there are protocols for managing bad trips. A clinician can bring you down with a Xanax or some other drug if things are really running off the rails for you. And bad trips aside, one wants to have good trips that lead to genuinely transformational insights. As Roland pointed out in this conversation, many people have good experiences that don't change their lives very much. So to get the benefit, I think you need to approach the use of these tools seriously. And hopefully free people will eventually be free to do that with all the support and guidance that science can offer. That is, if the government doesn't kick in the door and put a stop to the whole thing in the meantime. The potential of these drugs to help people is so great, even people who are otherwise well, that it would be a tragedy if we lost this moment again. I want, yeah, pause there for one second. Mm -hmm. One example you often hear, in which I heard from the person I was working with who went to do it, that person did the ketamine stuff. So from what I understand, I spoke to the medical director of the clinic. It's called Field Trip. Um, This is certainly not a promotion. It is Uh, connected or one of their board members is part of John Hopkins, which is connected to that guy, Roland, that he's referring to. It's given in a dose that produces a psychedelic experience. Mm. Anyhow, the person said it was, I'm, I'm probably not quoting perfectly, but the person said it was the first time they can remember where they didn't feel depressed. So we can be sort of smashed out of our prisms of reference And the person finally remembered or had in a moment where they did not feel depressed. Yeah. So that's what, in some sense, he was saying not normal people can be helped by these things as well, no doubt. Uh, But for the people that are really suffering, being snapped out of that rigid frame of reference is wonderful. And I think what we do know from some of the research is over time, the effects tend to dwindle. So I think research wise, probably people are trying to figure out how do you maintain the gains and maybe there is research out there and if anybody's watching this who knows about it why don't you click a put a link to some of that research in the in the comments so in in the mental health space there's there's huge debates about like what works and what doesn't and are you cbt are you act are you whatever other acronym to reflect different therapy models modalities um what sam harris just said and, and mike what you're suggesting is well, I don't know if you're suggesting it, Sam Harris is, is that there, there's like, it's, this works. And well, it can. there's no it uncertainty can. or questions, yeah. but is, is psychedelic treatment, is it controversial? Are there people who say we should not be going down this road? What do you, what's your sense of like the debate? If yeah. There is one. I don't think I'm informed enough to give a proper answer. Clearly, as he already pointed out, and I, I probably could have mentioned this before people. So I wouldn't have probably been allowed or I wouldn't be allowed to do something like this if I wanted to, because I have you as a patient. Yeah. Because I, because they screen for schizophrenia and bipolar in family histories and my brother lives with schizophrenia. So I don't know if I would be able to do it, so to speak. Otherwise though, there is good research Obviously, it's very difficult to do the research. Mm -hmm. And so I I know there's research on cancer patients who are basically waiting to die. Psilocybin 
to help them come to terms with what's going on. And supposedly it is really effective in that sense. Also as a recreational in the past drug user or drug addict, clearly there's many benefits to doing these drugs. Mm -hmm. I'm not promoting one way or the other, just commenting on that too. Yeah. In Mike, in your experience with drugs, did you ever have positive? I mean, you, I know you, so you, sp you describe your experience as one of addiction, something to, to get over, to conquer, not to return to. Right. Were there any experiences that you felt were, wow, I really shocked myself out of depression. I learned something about myself. Did you have, do you have any of those? Yeah. Did you have any of those like moments? I definitely had some moments where that, I think Sam Harris probably talks about it, where the sense of self disappears. Hmm. The ego, the me, the my, we were talking about this briefly earlier, that disappears and you feel connected to everything. Right. There's no barrier to that whole cliche of love, man. Like it's all love. I love right. you. This it's is real. so, it is it's real in those real. moments. It's yeah. so real. So I've had some beautiful experiences with that. I often refer to one particular experience where I think it was about 22, maybe partying at a cottage with many people, myself, I don't know, there was maybe five or six of us, probably half and half guys, girls. We were whole, we were in a beautiful freshwater lake standing up mm -hmm. and we all just decided to pee together. <laughs> Being in the lake, holding hands or like arms around each other. I can't remember. It was so ridiculous. Right. But but that was such an, a moment of just, right. we're all one. This doesn't matter. Let's have this moment together. Right. It was pretty amazing. But So that's one moment where, you know, perhaps the benefit of these <laughs> drugs allowed us to have a lovely moment together. Did you have the, did you have the opposite where you were... You're high and you're like, I, I never want to do this again. This is really screwing me up. Yes. Like, is that, yes. was that more, I, more of the experience? I don't know. You know, I did have that mo experience as a 12 year old prepubescent kid mm. where I didn't know what was happening to me. I was probably in some form of drug induced psychosis. That certainly was unpleasant. I wanted that to stop and go away. I just don't. And there were other times where. I was begging for it to end because yeah. it's tormenting. I remember one time I had a cast, I broke my arm and I was freaking out. Mm -hmm. I was with my girlfriend and two of her friends and I, I just get this cast off me, please. I, <laughs> right. I was begging them to cut it off. Right. <laughs> and, like... and then, you know, obviously a few hours later I was fine, but right. um, anyway, so maybe That's we a tough few hours. Oh, it was horrible. It was right. a disaster. Ah, <sighs> okay. Should we okay. get back to this? Yeah. We're kind of, what about you? I don't, yeah. What about, what about me? I don't know. I, what's your experience with these I'm things? So, I was always been like, so through like university and, and high school, yeah, like you would, you would smoke marijuana, you know, would smoke weed. And, but I was never, I was always like too nervous of a kid and not, and not willing to, like, I never liked feeling out of control. Like I hate it. There's times when, you know, if you're in grade 10 or 11, it's like your first few times experiencing yeah, this yeah. at a party and it's like, smoke a bit too much and just feel like spinning and it's you know i i hated that so much so why i asked you about your experience as a 12 year old is because my the way i interpreted all those things was don't just be so careful like don't and that's you know as you get older you become more mature about how to manage yeah, it. you know what yeah, you yeah. take and in what order and at what time and you know all that stuff but i was never i was always sort of worried about it like I can't believe this is be going on, on YouTube, but um, my parents. Here. But like, like so the, the the weed you and I would have been smoking. We're similar, you know. You're you're same yeah. age practically. Um, it was not like government regulated. It was sort of just came through like some weird network of people that I never understood, and then it would end up in the hands of a buddy, right? And you would give him fifteen dollars, and he would give you a little zipper, and then it's like okay. <laughs> and I always thought like, where, like, how do I know? What is this? I was always, asking, right, and right, that's right, my, right. a bit of my personality. Like, yeah, yeah. How do I know? And that always held me back a bit. And um, it's I had probably a good thing. Far more, far more enthusiastic about it. Um, and I went along to the extent that I had to, because you know, you have to, yeah, you sort of have to fit in. And, yeah, yeah. But um, and some elements were are great, right? Like, it, but I always had the other part of me was don't do too much. Be, I'm worried. Am I in control? Do I know where I am? Do I trust these people around me? So I was right, like right. slightly, um, 
I wouldn't say paranoid hesitant, about it. Hesitant, maybe. It wasn't paranoia because yeah. I didn't feel like it, it, it overtook me, but I felt like I was, yeah, hesitant. Yeah, yeah. All right. That yeah. was a good... So that's, I mean, that's not, a, that's not exciting, but... <laughs> No, but it's interesting, right? And and obviously many people share that. Yeah. Like yeah. I don't know what this so like yeah. This stuff on like with, with mushrooms and psychedelics inside of me, it's like so unappealing. Yeah. You know, that that's a, that's separate from does it work? Does it would it really make my life better? I'm I'm I wanna be like intellectually open for mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. But emotionally, I'm like, I'm never, I'm, I would never, I would never even, never want to. No, sorry. That kind of thing. That's yeah, my, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah. The brain is like, be open, think about oh, what, what's man. being said. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go back here. So where to begin? Well, here's what I did. I took five grams of dried mushrooms <laughs> and stayed blindfolded throughout the trip. I had never done this before. All my previous mushroom trips had been in nature at lower doses, and I'd never taken any psychedelic blindfolded. This was always Terence McKenna's recommendation. Five dried grams of mushrooms in the dark. And he always talked about this experience as though he were throwing down a gauntlet of sorts. He would say things like, if you really think you have an interest in the nature of mind, if you really have the courage of your convictions, well, then just take five grams of mushrooms in the dark, and you'll see how much you didn't know. And I was aware that I had never done this, right? And I hadn't done it because I was scared to do it, frankly. It really was a kind of failure of nerve. I'd been hearing Terrence talk about this since the early 90s. And uh, I'd had several bad trips on LSD and even on mushrooms at lower doses that had given me cause for concern. I'd had wonderful experiences on both those compounds as well, but the possibility of losing one's mind and of not getting it back feels real after a bad trip, even if it remains statistically unlikely. But after 25 years, I recognize that I'm at a different point in my life, and I had this nagging feeling that there was something for me to learn here. And it must be said that my wife, Annika, was strongly encouraging me to do this. She was really insistent that I do it. And so, as one does, I put it on the calendar. Now, as I discussed with Roland, there was one experience with psychedelics I had never had, which is often reported by people who take psilocybin at higher doses, as well as DMT. And that is the encounter with something that seems to have a mind of its own. And I was interested to have that experience. And unlike the LSD experiences I remember from my youth, there was a sense of being guided deeper across this landscape of mind by something. I thought about this as the mushroom itself. Now, of course, I'd been primed to think along these lines by listening to Terence McKenna rave about these things for many years. But there's no denying that there were parts of the experience that felt like an encounter with something other than my own mind. Now, to be clear, I'm not drawing any ontological conclusions from that. I'm just reporting the character of the experience. As I said, I was blindfolded throughout the trip. So, at first, it's like being locked in a dark closet. But as I was waiting for something to happen, I began to feel that there was a jaguar in the closet with me. And I began to suspect that some accommodations would have to be made. Now, unlike the DMT report that Roland and I laughed about in this podcast, I wasn't raped by a jaguar but I can't say we're entirely on platonic terms either. <laughs> now, psilocybin is highly visual, and the visions come in waves, and each time they receded, I found myself saying or thinking, show me more. Again, there was a sense of being led by something across an inner landscape. I just want to pause for a second there. What I, I want to get your clarification. Mm. It seems that he's implying that there's a point in which it's almost as you meet some sort of character who's talking to you. The jaguar. Yeah, or uh, another state of mind. It's not just that you're tripping in your own mind. You encounter almost like another being mm -hmm. or another persona. Does that seem like what he's implying or no? I think so. I'm just trying to think if I ever had any experiences like that. So what, what is this jaguar? 
So you're in the, he's in this. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we should keep listening and see. So what he's, this. okay. So he, he takes five grams of mushrooms. Blindfolded. Is that is a lot. I don't, I've never took that. I never took that much. And he's blindfolded. Yeah. Do he know where? At home? By yeah, himself? probably. Yeah. In a no closet. guide. No guide. No. Maybe his wife's in there. And Maybe. Or something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and he, and he says, to, okay, two things. He says, it's like I experienced something other than my mind. Correct. That's what I was trying to what get is to. That? What does that mean? I don't know. I think what I assume it means is it's as if you encounter some external being, right? Yeah. Or God or whatever you want to call it. Another. Right. It's almost like you're hallucinating another thing. Out of outer body, out of body experience. Or out of mind experience. Of mind experience. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe out of body. I don't know. But uh, and he's Okay. <laughs> just that that whole yeah. i can't say we're completely on platonic terms here. <laughs> right <laughs> anyway so may, let's keep going yeah right okay okay yeah all right and the notion of visions doesn't quite capture it the experience isn't confined to one sense domain there's a merging of the senses in a synesthesia so one is really having a vision with one's whole body you may know the Renaissance sculpture by Bernini of the ecstasy of St. Teresa. That captures the mood pretty well. There's just an utter surrender to this thing. It's like your mind is being extruded across a landscape and conformed to it and squeezed and evaporated. There's definitely a motif of sacrifice here and dismemberment. It's like you are the lucky human sacrifice. And to say that one's mind has simply been shot out among the stars is somehow to trivialize the experience. Again, it's not merely a matter of seeing in a vast space. It's a matter of feeling to a degree that defies description. I mean, I can dimly remember feeling such intense gratitude that I wouldn't expect to feel any other emotion for the rest of my life. And there's no question that having experience of this kind in the context of believing specific religious doctrines could seem to confirm some of those doctrines. Yeah, I want to pause there for a second. That I can relate to for sure. Just that, and I assume many people can, that pure freedom, again, like freedom from self, freedom from the ego. Mm -hmm. Nothing is real except this blissfulness, this deep gratitude and love for reality in that moment well drug-induced reality in that moment and that is a profound experience one which maybe he gets to it and we should probably go back to the video one which we are tasked with pursuing after the trip and this goes back to a little bit what i was saying before about the mcmindfulness of yeah. these yeah. ceremonies that people do whatever and i think it's terence mckenna i think who said you know, the psychedelics are the phone call, but you need to hang up the phone. You need to put the phone down, go back into life and explore this mm -hmm. and, and seek it or practice it or, or pursue it in your own way. And that's part of what I think people get lost and they don't get that message. And certainly I didn't, right? I, I kept right. doing and doing and doing, but there's a little bit of a different reason. So um, in what we just heard, yeah. like I'm having trouble understanding what he's talking about maybe due to lack of experience maybe and also maybe we should listen a bit more about but i just wanted to i yeah. just wanted to flag to so one he says it's like his mind was um Extrude, condensing and he says ex extruding over a landscape i've never i don't actually know what the word extruding means yeah me so maybe dictionary.com yeah could help us out for a second but spreading out to spread out to push or to thrust out. out yeah he says like his mind is he's being like, condensed <laughs> and then evaporating yeah so that's a strange one. The second one is this intense feeling of gratitude. I'm wondering if that's the only emotion that tends to come up. So love and gratitude seem to be... So these drugs must hit on something in the brain that triggers that. I guess you get other drugs that get to anger. and Maybe, yeah. Just... Yeah, I think, yeah, there's one angel dust. I can't remember what it's called, but that's often leads people to a lot of violence. Mm. There's a name for it. I can't remember what it is. Anyway. Just the way it interacts with the... Angel dust, yeah. It's uh you know, one one thing you I think is relatable to that experience for me would be for anyone who hasn't had a child, mm -hmm. but 
what it's like when you see your child for the first time and you hold the child. I mean, it is such a crazy moment. It's a crazy moment. And all your, Mm. you know, your thinking mind, your rational kind of status quo thought process, it all disappears, right? You're just merged with this little creature Mm. and the self. So that for me is, is somewhat analogous to other moments in this office when I'm sitting with clients and they have these deep insights into something that they've been. Yeah. It's just so beautiful. And for me, that's like a moment of freedom from self, right? Freedom from this kind of prism of, of our minds and our. It's so funny. Yeah. That, so that, that little thing you just did. So I was thinking, so when my son was born. Yeah. So my wife went through like a, like a more of a drawn out pregnancy, you know, wasn't all that complicated, but it's challenging for her. Not sorry. Not sorry. Labor. I don't know yeah. It was long. I remember like when he came out and it was sort of like we were getting near near the end. Um, I'm I'm like I feel choked up. I feel like I'm about to cry, but I'm always co- constantly like down regulating. Maybe that's not the right word. But regulating sure, myself. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Putting my brain back in, back into the rational prison prism or prison. You know, it's not. Yeah. Yeah. Him, yeah. <laughs> but. Um, to get the emotion out of the experience, like to get it out. I didn't want to, I, it's not like I do it on purpose. It's, mm. it's a, how do I not cry in front of people? How do I not? And it, it, I'm not so worried about what it does. It's not conscious. Right. It's just, I wanted to, so that, I mean, back to your question about drug use. I mean, I, there's, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say I pushed down my feelings a lot, but there's a lot of containing them, mm. just taking off the, the sharp jagged edges of the feeling and just making it a bit more less, significant so i felt bad and i and i just contrast that with what you're talking about and what sam harris is talking about which is this like overwhelming feeling yes yes and i tend to i for good or for ill try to make it underwhelming sure for always trying to like just like work like if i feel like i'm gonna cry just working through that feeling to like not get there just stay Sounds like you might be a good candidate for some uh, psychedelics. No, I, I would. I probably. I, I, I'm scared to like what. Like the other thing is, I'm scared of being out of, a bit out of control. Yeah, yeah. For reasons I don't understand, and then um, what one one and like I, what what's there? Like what? So Sam Harris has yeah, this jaguar, yeah. but like what's what's in there? And like, is it, is it worth me knowing? And you know, I, I'm, yeah, my yeah, life that's is a good sort question. Fine, so like maybe yeah, just, yeah, yeah, maybe. maybe. I'm ignorant, you know, rather, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't, I don't mean. Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe. No, it's a good question. A good thought, and I, only you really would know the answer. I like, do what think the, what are the ben- so, yeah, it's not what sorry, you sorry. think. Often, it's mm. just not what you think. What do, what do you what do you mean? Yeah, I think. I mean, mushrooms are to me. Mushrooms were the most intense drug for me, but I I did mushrooms, acid, LSD, ecstasy, MDMA. Ecstasy and MDMA are some like basically. Ecstasy is just like trash Mm. crap added to MDMA. Mushrooms are always found to be the most intense, but for MDMA, it's not what you think. It's as if it's like a freedom in a sense. Anyway, but I think you point out some good things there and... I'm sure you, many I other like, people. I like okay. totally cut your, your Maybe I did. I what did. Happened? But wait, like, what okay. What happened? happened? Sorry. What happened there yeah, for me? The exit ramp. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. I did. Um, you don't have to finish it, but no, no, no. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So the mushrooms for me, when it went well, Mm -hmm. was wonderful. Yeah. When it didn't go well, it was really unpleasant. A lot of worry and paranoia. And Sam Harris mentioned he had bad trips too. Mm -hmm. With MDMA, I never had a bad experience with ecstasy. I did. Mm -hmm. I probably got some dirty shit. Um, but yeah, it's not what you think. That's sort of how I started. It's sort of often described when telling people about a 12-step meeting or something like that. Mm. I'm always sort of say, it's not what you think. We have these ideas of what it's going to be. It's a cult. And I'm just, in terms right, of a 12-step right. meeting, you know, it's a it's weird a- place. Everyone's talking about God and blah, 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 blah. And that's not, that's not what it is. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think for, for these type of drugs, it's saying it's not what you think. And I think part of the insight is that it's 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 seeing that that the way we perceive things in this frame of reference that we're often 
stuck in can be shattered. Like mm. you can see outside of that or, or, and, and right. it, it, it's actually quite freeing as opposed to, I can't remember the word you used, but Constraining. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or worrying. Right. It's actually the opposite of that. Yeah. 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 No, it's my the, it's my quote unquote rational mind that worries. Yes. Too, yes. But it's yes, not yes, actually yes. shouldn't be a worrying thing. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. I, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for uh keep you on track. Yeah. Yeah. It's my job here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> if for instance I had been a Christian with some notion of the Holy Spirit rattling around in my brain, well then I would count this experience as a full collision with it and proof of its reality. But as most of you know, my day job is to not be fooled by spurious ideas passed down from our ignorant ancestors. So I'm very slow to make claims about what I think is going on here. And there's no question that areas of the brain that represent our relationship to other minds can get triggered arbitrarily, just as Roland suggested. This happens every night when we dream. We feel ourselves to be in relationship to people and things that don't exist. And frankly, the sense of otherness was actually a minor component in the end. Mainly, it was an experience of mental reality utterly beyond what I recognized to be my own mind. It was not merely impersonal in the sense that I was brought beyond any reference to my own life. There was no discernibly human aspect to parts of this landscape. Now, the first revelation is with respect to the absolute insufficiency of language to capture the experience. I mean, you are wading into a roiling ocean of meaning with the proverbial thimble. What you bring back in that thimble you just can't begin to indicate the immensity of the experience, or its beauty, or its terror, depending. Even to oneself, as an aid to memory, language is next to useless. And the fact that there are landscapes of mind this vast, lurking on the other side of a mushroom, is simply preposterous. I mean, how could that make any sense? The scale of the thing is all wrong. It violates every intuition you have about what it is to have a mind and a body in a world. It's as though we lived in a universe where if you just reached into your right pocket with your left hand, Rather than pull out your wallet, you'd pull out the Andromeda galaxy. So the experience is altogether too much. It's like a reductio ad absurdum of one's desire for experience itself. It's as though the cosmos were saying, oh, experience is what you want? You want to see and feel and think? Okay, how's this? And then what follows is a vision so blinding in its beauty and intensity, that it shatters your mind. It just unmakes you. Again, I have to admit the poverty of words here. Okay, we have a word for love, for instance. But what's the word for all the love you can possibly feel, and all the love that you recognize that you have failed to feel at every moment in your life up until this moment? What do we call the experience of having that ocean of feeling invade you? and fill every empty space in your mind. There really are no words to describe this experience, just as there's no way of snapping your fingers to describe it. Language is simply the wrong tool for the job. Now, how does mindfulness relate to phenomena of this kind? Okay, yeah, I want to pause there for one second. I, I th we've, we've touched on what he was just saying a little bit, right? Everything just ceases to be all our rigid frames of reference and our caveats for oh wait i love I, I can feel love for everybody oh no 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 i can't because that person said this thing and then yeah. if i love that person then uh they'll let me down or whatever 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 yeah. i do sort of distinctly remember mind states where i would be blast into this barrierless like loveless sort of mm -hmm. open love for everything and then and then at moments sort of that little rational node would pop in a little bit and and sort of say well i'm not so sure about that kind right. of idea and in particular when you come down or when the trip ends i often recall questioning that sometimes right, right. oh how is it possible that 2 hours ago I 
was in love with the world. Right. And it now I now I just recognize the impossibility of that. Yeah. And that's an that was always an interesting dichotomy for me. Yet that feeling of blissfulness, of openness, of connectedness, that I can get in touch with today from time to time, often when working with people. Also just in moments of deep mindfulness, which it sounds like he's gonna start talking about, or presence is probably a better word. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even in conversations like this, right? Mm -hmm. Where you and I are sort of in a place that's beyond ourselves yeah. in dialogue or yeah. whatever. Yeah. He's talking a lot about, he talked about how, I mean, he's talking a lot about his experience using words while saying right. there's yeah. no yeah. words to describe his experience. <laughs> right. I don't feel, I think he's actually doing a much better job, but maybe, maybe, I mean, he, okay, he went through it. He probably says, there's nothing I could tell you that could come close to what I went through. Right. But what I'm hearing is something like all the stop signs in our brain go away. Yeah for the duration of the drug induced experience yes so like we have all these like physical stop signs to protect us from getting injured and we have all these so there's our physical we have all these emotional stop yeah. signs that protect yeah. us from being judged from emotional harm yes yeah from something from, like that yeah from yeah. from being kicked out of the group from yeah whatever um that sounds like it just takes it all away Yep. Like it just, it does. You're going to feel, yeah, we're always, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself. Like I always feel like, like always restraining myself in some ways. Like I don't want to, like I love, like I was telling Michelle, my, you know, my, my wife about like, I love, like in moments where people are going through like real life things, like they've lost someone or something, or they're going through a struggle. Like I find I'm my most alive mm. and I've, you know, this goes back to like one of our first podcasts we did like years ago where, you know, a friend lost a, like a loved one and having conversations with them was like some of the best conversations I've ever had. And some of the yeah. most like, I hate to use this, not fun's not the right word, but no, just, meaningful. Just, just like, wow, like you, you feel, you feel, you feel more alive. Yeah. I think our brains have this ability to make us feel just like the monotony, like just like you're going through steps and maybe what Sam is talking about with, with his mushroom experiences, all that goes away and suddenly you're so yes up emotionally and really awake. And just you feel everything so deeply and you yeah. see all these yeah. things yeah. and you feel the beauty of I think it's the pr the prison, if you will, or the yeah. that stuff slips away. Yeah. Yeah. And it's high every emotion, a lot of the emotions. So that's why a, a good trip can be amazing and a bad trip can be yeah, a terror. Yeah, 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 yeah. He used that word interestingly. He said a terror. Oh, it's horrible. So it's every horrible. emotion is heightened, including potentially negative ones. Yeah, it's terrible. Super I can even when we're talking about it, I have small obviously memories. Yeah. And and obviously biological memories in there, whatever that means exactly. But yeah, I have tiny sensations of that terror. Yeah. come up for me yeah. when I think about these things and when I talk yeah. about particularly bad experiences and also the pleasant ones. Well, thank you. <laughs> Peace. Okay, everybody, I am back to finish this video about Sam Harris discussing psychedelics and the impact on mind, <clears throat> mental health, and just general consciousness. My illustrious colleague, Dr. Zernet, will not be here. He's on vacation uh, for the summer quite a bit. And we decided that it was best if I just finish up the video. So let's get back to the video and we'll go from there. Now, how does mindfulness relate to phenomena of this kind? Well, both meditation and psilocybin seem to have the same effect of decreasing activity in the default mode network. This network has been widely associated with self-referential thinking. And as Roland mentioned, there was a study just published recently on the interaction between mindfulness and psilocybin. They took a group of expert meditators and put them on a silent retreat for five days and gave half the group psilocybin and the other half a placebo on day four. And then they evaluated them on many measures of meditative and mystical experience and then followed up at four months to assess the lasting effects. The important point is that on four-month follow-up, the measures of appreciation for life and self-acceptance and concern for society and planetary values, a sense of purpose, a lack of anxiety around death and dying. By all of these measures, the psilocybin group looks nothing like the controls. And compared to other studies with psilocybin, 
mindfulness appears to increase these effects and minimize the negative experiences. But the general picture with psilocybin, with or without mindfulness, is that, as Roland said, something like 70 to 80% of people who take the drug under controlled therapeutic conditions rated among the top five most important experiences of their lives, which is extraordinary. Now, I definitely think my experience in meditation helped me here. I got to jump in there for a minute. 70 to 80%, I think you said, and, and albeit that study had a small participant group, Nevertheless, that is a huge effect on people. And notice how he said people that use it in a therapeutic environment. This references a little bit to what we described, uh, David and I were talking about in reference to the mindfulness or the spiritual materialism of consuming these substances. And as Sam is going into here, he is alluding to the research that combines this idea of the mindfulness experience, the ability to notice and be in touch with different states of mind and different states of body, even if you will, that are in reference to compassion or what we would call loving kindness directed outwards to the world. And that's a pretty amazing effect. And I think ideally that's what these drugs are trying or I say this, the experience we get from these substances is ideally to connect us to these states of being where we are more loving, we are more connected, we're more understanding, we're more wise, if you will. And just to also touch on the default mode network that Sam is referencing here, that sort of fancy jargon for when we're not engaged in a task or in an activity, the default mode network engages in thinking and it's generally thinking about the past and usually not pleasantly, so often ruminating about the past or worrying about the future. And what mindfulness does is it helps reduce the default mode activity so that we're more present and more connected to what's happening now which obviously leads to better mood more consistently over time. And what we want to learn here again is that the, the psychedelics are the phone call. I think I mentioned this before. We get the message of what's possible. We need to hang up the phone and go out into life and practice working on bringing that message back into our lives without the psychedelics. All right, let's get back to the video. And I was conscious at many points of surrendering to the experience by cutting through the sense of self, which is to say subject-object dualism, as I discuss elsewhere in the Waking Up app. But there were also vast stretches of time where there was simply no recollection that mindfulness was an option. Again, it's hard to communicate how far gone one is. During the peak of the experience, which might last an hour or 90 minutes or so, there was no memory at all of having taken a drug. There was no reference point to my life in any sense. There was no possibility of controlling anything or of having a plan. Another analogy comes to mind here. Mindfulness seems to me like the discovery of fire, right? You can kindle it yourself, laboriously at first, but eventually you can produce it on demand, and it warms you, and you can put it to many useful purposes. And it really is fire right? It's the real thing, as much as any other fire in the universe. But five grams of mushrooms is like being hurled into the sun. Just want to jump in there to reiterate that idea of mindfulness and fire. It does take a while to get that fire going. It does take effort, practice, if you will, discipline or commitment to a meditation practice in order to experience the fire and experience the warmth, to use that analogy, that is generated by the fire. And the better or the more practice, the more skillful you get with the practice, the quicker you can build spark and feel the warmth of that fire. And it really does have significant impact on our lives. And that significance is subtle in moments, but the accumulation of these moments over time is hard to quantify. A simple example would be, say you drive to work five days a week, you spend an hour and a half in the car. Let's say you aren't very skillful with this 
ability, uh, the mindfulness, the quelling and the, the centering of the mind. And let's say you get angry for 20 to 30 minutes of that daily drive because of the traffic, because of other drivers, because whatever else it is. Think about the impact on your life. If you could reduce that anger by 50%, 80%, even 5%, 10%, whatever it is, the impact is hard to quantify, although it is profound. And then think about all the other moments of your life where you could reduce the suffering, enhance the presence, enhance the pleasant emotion. Pretty amazing. I'm going to stop talking. Let's get back to the video because he goes into, I think, this experience of being blasted into the mushroom state. This is like being hurled into the sun. You can't use this experience at all, but it's there. It's not merely consciousness without the feeling of self. It's the utter erasure of anything recognizably human about your mind. Now, if that scares you, perhaps it should. And there definitely is a fear of death or madness to overcome here. Because resistance is just futile and very painful. And there's no doubt that many religious ideas in some way relate to this domain of experience. For instance, one could say that to recoil from the beatific vision is to be cast into hell, right? Or alternately, one could say that one gets forced out of the Garden of Eden and thereafter there's an angel with a flaming sword at one's back. And then one is left wandering this desiccated world of egoity, filled with fear and craving and confusion. These oppositions describe a kind of geometry of mind. And the way out of hell is simply to surrender all resistance, to recognize that consciousness itself, at its core, is imperturbable. Being itself is intrinsically free of its apparent changes. But it's true that realizing this, with a Category 5 hurricane of eschatology bearing down on you, is easier said than done. Now what kept me sane, again, was gratitude and dropping the self and remaining open to experience and good intentions. Really, I think love is the ballast you want in your ship's hold as you set out over the abyss. Just want to stop that for a second. Uh, just to point out, for many people, I assume I put myself in this category. I had no relationship to mindfulness, no relationship to this idea of surrender, of being at one, of letting go when I was consuming a lot of these substances. As I mentioned earlier, I, you know, I'm in recovery from addiction. So I wasn't using them in this way. I don't know how that applies to many people in, in that regard. If you are listening to this and you either have a lot of experience with mindfulness and you are considering experimenting with these drugs, or you've experimented a lot with these drugs and you're curious about mindfulness or what Sam is, is describing here, you should explore that <laughs> from both sides. Now, I'm at a point in my life where I've made the decision where I will not do these drugs again, even with over a decade of recovery and over a decade of meditation practice. So, I don't know what Sam's talking about. I won't be able to experience that. And that's okay for me. But there is a difference in those who have the capacity to do what Sam is describing and those who do not. And wherever you fit on that spectrum, it's important to contemplate that and to consider how that might impact your experiences moving forward if you choose to do psychedelics. Now, this isn't to say that the experience might not have gone some other way for me or that it couldn't go some other way in the future. Because I think there is something about the initial trajectory of the launch that seems to matter. And in this case, my mind seemed totally permeated with feelings of gratitude and love and awe as the experience was achieving its peak intensity. The return to normal waking consciousness was a little shaky. To stick with the rocket analogy, there definitely was a sense that my vehicle might break up on re-entry. The first experience that is analogous to actually slamming down into the atmosphere of Earth is the surprising recollection that you've taken a drug, right? 
you've forgotten that. And this entails the realization that you are someone who was so far gone on drugs that you had no memory you had taken a drug in the first place. And although I'm not a clinician, it seemed easy enough to diagnose myself as psychotic at that point. And then, of course, the door to unpleasant thoughts immediately opens. You had such a good life, and now you've gone and ruined your mind on drugs. How are you going to explain this to your wife, that she's now married to a madman? But again, one is bouncing off the atmosphere here. So the recollection that one has taken a drug gets forgotten and must be relearned again and again as one skids and shudders and then finally comes hammering down through the atmosphere back to earth. <laughs> that is a great analogy for anybody who has experience with these drugs or anyone, again, curious about them. Sam describes it quite well there. We really are blasted into another world. Uh, of mind in particular. <laughs> and that recollection that that's what you have done and that there is another state of consciousness that you are about to re-enter that's fil filled with suffering and all your inadequacies and all the difficulties uh, of life is an interesting one. And in reference to what Sam's saying, having that ability for the mindfulness to notice that more closely and to observe its qualities and, and challenges probably is quite insightful. And that would be interesting to experience. So next time you're coming down or coming off one of these highs, can you really start to notice this interplay between the pleasantness of, of your high and the bumpy road back into normal waking consciousness. It's really interesting. Let's get back to it. Now, as good as my trip was, at moments like this, one does pray rather fervently to the god of homeostasis. Just let my brain return to its boring 20-watt glow. Right? I'll take an ordinary <laughs> human mind, thank you very much. But happily, my mind reassembled itself. And there were no stray pieces I could see left on the floor anywhere. And I feel none the worse for wear. In fact, I feel saner than I felt in quite some time. My priorities are straighter. It's like something that needed stretching got a good stretch for about a million years. Again, there are people who should not take these drugs. But in the vast majority of cases, normalcy returns. Now, I will do my best to stay current with the research in this area as it continues to come in. And I really am looking forward to a time when psychedelic therapy is a legal, established clinical science. This really must happen. We need a modern, rational, ethically responsible way of reinstantiating the mysteries of elusis. We need to understand the furthest reaches of human well-being. And many of us need to experience these states of mind directly so that we can create an ethics and a politics and a culture, generally, that has its priorities straight. And there's no question that the use of these tools is entirely compatible with the path of meditation. For some people, and I include myself here, initial experience with psychedelics is probably the only thing that could convince us that a path exists and that there's a landscape of mind worth exploring. And the combining of a silent retreat with a high-dose psilocybin session, as was recently done in the study that Roland referenced, seems like a great idea. The title of that paper, incidentally, is Characterization and Prediction of Acute and Sustained Response to Psychedelic Psilocybin in a Mindfulness Group Retreat. That is a terrible title for a very important <laughs> study. And if human history bends in the direction it should at this point, there will be retreat centers set up to do that sort of thing in the near future. And I'm certainly going to spend some time thinking about how to help make that happen. Of course, I'll do my best to bring whatever relevant resources I can to the Waking Up app, and it's safe to assume that I will be watching this space and speaking with more people doing this research and doing what I can to support it. And with that, I leave you. Until next time. All right. Thank you, Sam. I, I absolutely agree with him in reference to integrating these substances into therapeutic 
treatment, clinical care. Over the years of working with people taking various psychiatric medications, mental health medications, clearly we need to discover more things. I don't think there's been a breakthrough in psychiatric medication in many, many years outside, in decades, outside of antipsychotic medications. And that's a tragedy because they often don't work or there's all kinds of side effects and we need something better. People deserve better. People get put on these medications way too quickly. They're not monitored. They're not really cared for very well. And it is difficult, difficult to, to manage these things. First of all, access to care, access to doctors, access to assessment tools to measure the effectiveness of these things. It's all very difficult and hard for people. We desperately need advancements and that kind of stuff. And it does seem like the thorough, effective research methods that Sam was referencing here and that Roland, I got, I'm forgetting his last name. I want to say Roland Fryer, but it's not Roland Fryer. Griffiths, I think Roland Griffiths. Um, anyway, people like that. Uh, we desperately need these things. I do know some people who have greatly benefited from psychedelic or ketamine treatment in Canada. I don't think we're there with the MDMA or the psilocybin quite yet. Anyhow, I hope you found this helpful. Please comment on it. Share it with someone you think might find it interesting. Subscribe to our channel. Consider supporting us on Patreon, please. And without further ado, I wish you all the best. I hope you found that helpful. Take it easy. Peace out. I am very grateful that you watched to the end of this video. Please click one of the boxes to watch more of our content and otherwise have a great day. Peace out. <laughs>